Um, well, thank you for coming on a Sunday. Obviously, we're here to update you on uh, something we don't obviously want to have to talk about um, or ever have to face, but we have. Um, so uh, I can just give you some of the basic information on the actual incident and, and uh, probably refer follow-on questions to the Detroit Police Department. So to, um, somewhere between 1 and 5.15 uh, yesterday, a car was stolen in Oakland County from Red Oaks Water Park. Our victim was a Rochester Hills resident. Uh, the Rochester Hills resident made contact, follow-up contact with one of our deputies out of the Rochester Hills substation, um, which then ultimately looped in our auto theft unit that was actively looking for that recently stolen car. It was a 2022 Chevy Equinox. Uh, three detectives from our auto theft unit were actively searching for that vehicle in Detroit. And uh, one of the detectives uh, was behind the vehicle, located the vehicle, at which point uh, the vehicle suddenly stopped. Uh, again, this is all preliminary. This is what we believe happened at this point. Uh, since it's an unmarked car, there's not dash cam or things like that. Uh, the car suddenly stopped. Uh, individuals exited that stolen vehicle and opened fire on our deputy. Uh, it was an ambush. <coughs> that uh, that uh, obviously uh, triggered a whole bunch of things. The deputy was struck in the head, struck in the chest, or the torso area. Uh, at 2250, the officer down call went out, and uh, obviously Detroit police and MSP uh, flooded the area very quickly. I'd like to thank and commend them for that. Um, Chief White called me within minutes. Um, Detroit police and MSP helped set up a, a hard perimeter, and within that perimeter, uh, three individuals were taken into custody. Um, so, again, anything further on that will probably come from DPD. But, again, I'd like to thank DPD and MSP for their assistance in this terrible moment for us. Um, now, the focus of this for us at this point, obviously, in addition to getting justice from the criminal justice system, is how we support a family that's, uh, and an agency that's been crushed. You know, things like this are soul crushing. And, uh, you know, this family has a, a five, a four, and a one year old with another child on the way. So, um, our mission is to be there for them. So, I guess, you know, a lot of people are calling and saying, what can they do? So, the first thing they can do, if they, like I, believe in prayers, they can pray for the family and for um, our agency and the community. Um, secondly, you know, Oftentimes there's offers to financially support a family, obviously a family uh, of four babies and a, a now a young widow um, is going to have a lot of financial holes. So um, we have a, a charity called Mission Oakland. If anyone wants to contribute to the family, uh, they can contribute, write a check or uh, send a check or uh, any kind of donation to Mission Oakland, which is a licensed charity, 100% of that will go to the family uh, without any fees or deductions like you get on GoFundMe. So um, just put in the memo um, that it's for deputy recklings and 100% uh, of that will go to the family. Um, in addition to supporting the family, you know, support our, our team the sheriff's office you know it's uh, it's been a challenge been a stretch and you know looking in the face of our people and seeing their pain it's been tough on them you know with uh, we lost deputy overall then we had COVID uh, then we had Oxford then a lot of the same people went to MSU and then they were at the splash pad and now this and it kind of it's like a boxer. You wonder how many punches they can get and still stay standing. But the first thing I would say is I'm super proud of our people, uh, the way they have stayed standing, the way they have showed up and 
continue to do amazing things every day. Uh, but we need to support them. I said after the splash pad that we need more resources uh, for the community at large and mental health resources. But we need it in public safety. Peer-to-peer um, -peer programs are vastly underfunded across this country. We know that in the last couple years, line of duty deaths have been terrible. Ambushes are up dramatic. Now we have another example of that. And the one thing that most people don't realize is officer uh, involved suicides outstrip the number of line of duty deaths the last couple of years. So the pressure on law enforcement, on public safety in general, is huge and it's taking its toll. And we need resources and that falls at the appropriators. So whether you're a federal appropriator, whether you're a state appropriator, or I'm calling on the county commission and the county uh, executive's office to have an emergency appropriation to add one full-time peer-to-peer person to our staff. We have one now, and we obtained that one when I cut a different position that we actually needed because I felt a peer-to-peer -peer was so important. But having only one to deal with what this agency has dealt with um, and to be able to do the kind of work that they're doing for an almost 1,500-person agency is vastly under-resourced. So, that's how uh, some of the governments and government officials that have called and said anything they can do to support, that would be the one thing they could do. Make some appropriations for peer-to-peer -peer programs and support the men and women of public safety that are dealing with these things. And, and, and that list that I gave you, mind you, those are big events. Every day they're dealing with other events. Uh, multiple fatalities in car accidents that we've dealt with in the last seven days. A child investigation where the child died from abuse. They see these things every day and you can't unsee them. And so we need to resource them with support to help them process that. So that's what people can do for public safety. Um, in terms of uh, talking about Deputy Reckling, um, the family wanted you all to hear from people that worked with him who knew him, what he was, what he was like, how big a hole he'll have left in his family, of course and obviously, but also in our agency and in the community. So he had been working extensively at the Rochester Hills substation and just had recently moved over to the auto theft unit. But uh, this comes from the substation commander. Detective Brad Reckling was one of the best deputies and detectives I've ever worked with. He was one of the hardest working cops I knew. He will be missed dearly by me and many others. He personally touched so many with his larger than life personality. Brad was on Rochester Hills patrol prior to him coming to our detective bureau there and there was a bank robbery that some thought was unsolvable. Brad spent hours researching the vehicle and ended up finding it on sale on Facebook Marketplace and ended up breaking the case wide open. And that was just one example of Brad's work ethic. From one of his coworkers, Dec uh, Deputy Nicholas uh, Bohan, Brad was always there to lend a helping hand. He loved his family more than anything. He was a great cop, but even a better friend and father and husband. From Deputy Nathan Rogers, Brad and I grew up in this department together, from working in the jail to studying for promotions to enduring and graduating from the academy together. Brad was one of the most selfless colleagues and one of the most dedicated husbands I've ever seen to Jackie and the best father to his girls. There's no other way to describe him other than just the best person. Deputy Matthew Morrison. Brad was a loving husband, father, and amazing friend. He loved the outdoors. He was an amazing fisherman, loved to hunt, and enjoyed growing his farm and raising animals. Brad spent several months remodeling his home, giving his wife and three girls the best place to call home. Anyone who knew Brad knows it doesn't take long for him to start cracking jokes and get him laughing. He was a great worker, an amazing friend who would do anything for anyone. 
He was a prime example of what great parent, husband, and friends means, and he's loved by many and will be truly missed. a picture that the family suggested was most appropriate. I'm moving it in. Uh, must be a technology guy. Can only do it. Hit that button four times. Um, so that's Brad and his amazing and loving family that we all collectively have to hold up, support, and provide love in his absence. And, uh, and there's no way to fill that hole. So uh, that's all we have at the moment. Um, questions? Our condolences to you, Sheriff, and the department. I know you talked about some of the uh, appropriations that you would like lawmakers to make for resources, but can you maybe just give us uh, a, a few examples of some resources that you and your team will be relying on to help you move through this difficult time, not only, as you said, with this unfortunate incident, but you're still dealing with Oxford. You're still dealing with what happened in Rochester Hills last weekend. Yeah, I mean, we flew in a couple specialists who are an amazing team that helped debrief public safety and military from crisis situations like what we just had at the Rochester Hills splash pad. They left on Saturday, uh, <laughs> and there, there's no money in our budget for that, but we flew them in. I, I hope and presume the county will pay for that, uh, but one way or another, we'll get it taken care of. We've already been in contact with them. You know, you can, you can just see in the face and the eyes of our people how soul-crushing this is. And, um, you know, a lot of people say Healy. I don't think the victims of Oxford or the victims of MSU or the victims of uh, the splash pad or the victims we see every day heal. They learn how to process, how to put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. And our people that deal with all of that every day uh, need that same process and they need a healthy way to offload some of that because in the moment we're trained to you know, suck it up, push it down, keep going, deal with what's in front of you, and that's what you have to do. But after that situation in the critical moment resolves itself, you have to give them the support and help and process to work through that. And that comes with resources. You know, I've been in this profession a very long time and it used to be hey it's part of the job get back out there and we know that doesn't work in the military or in public safety and the suicide numbers that you see are reflective of that but there's so many other things that are reflective of that and we need resources you know, the, the, the federal government the state government and the county governments Number one job is to protect its community. And I think right at that list needs to be support and protect the people that protect the community. Sheriff, what can you tell us about this, the crime that was taking place? Okay, so we know that the car that was stolen was located in Detroit, but right. is this a part of a bigger operation? Is it too early? Too yeah, early. It's too early to know if it's part of anything bigger. They were doing what they do, being good detectives, running down a, a lead on a car that had recently been stolen and trying to locate it. Um, you know, they do that every day. And lots of times they'll find the car abandoned and they call for a tow truck. In this situation, um, it turned out not to be that at all. 
And that's the other thing about this job. You don't know what they will become that day. And again, they get out of bed and suit up and they go off to work. And that's part of the stresses that's on them every day. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you didn't really do anything today. But if they answered five alarm calls and two bad PI accidents, all of that is inside of them. All that stress, all that adrenaline, all of that uh, actuating what goes on in your body, your system, your fight and flight, all of those things dump chemicals into your body, create stresses. And it's no wonder that, you know, so many people in public safety die shortly after they retire because their bodies have been just wore to the edge from their career. So long answer to your question, but we don't know uh, at this point if this is a bigger um, auto theft ring or just, you know, they picked that car that day. Was he alone when this happened or was he with a car one deputy? There were two other detectives. They were in their own cars. They were in the area looking for the car. He came on at first. They pulled up, and I, I saw him. You know. And how long was he with the department? Nine years. Mm -hmm. If you, I don't know, but what do you think happened that made these people get out of the car and ambush this deputy? Is it too early? I mean, just based on the initial investigation. You know, I can't get in their head. I can only surmise, given my years in police work, they felt they had been made, and that, that was their decision. To, instead of giving up or just running, to open fire on, on the lone deputy over a car. How is this going to change the way we handle car theft? This is a pretty regular occurrence. You know, we're in a dangerous business. Obviously, you'd like to have five or six people there, but at that point, I, I think it evolved very quickly, and sometimes our world evolves quickly. Somebody pulls a car over and someone comes out shooting. You know, we the only thing we can change is we can keep trying to train, give them better training, better equipment, more support, more deputies to work together, back each other up. But the reality is we have a dangerous, dangerous world and we have men and women that are willing to go in and face that evil down. And sometimes, you know, things like this happen. Thank you. Thank you.